Welcome to another episode of the Alice Chalmers Show, where going orange is going great. I'm Jim. And I'm Luke. This episode is actually more footage from the Orange Spectacular this year. They had a presentation about the living history of the roto -Baylor. I was originally going to add it to the other video, but I thought, you know what? This deserves a video on its own. So, I hope you enjoy it. And, and let's take a look. Uh, my name is Gary Eggerson, and uh, my association with the Roto Baylor was in 1952. I was probably uh, four years old, and Dad bought one, and uh, I never got to use it when I was uh, farming with Dad. But uh, when I got old enough to lift a bale, he sold it, and then we went to square bales. So uh, I grew up with them. I know a little bit about them and uh, we're trying to keep everyone alive that we can. But today we're going to tell you some uh, interesting things about them, uh, and we've got some other special things here today also. Uh, we've got celebrities here from Canada. Gilbert would normally do this, and his brother and chief engineer Keith Monroe and Roy are here. And uh, they were, I was up there this spring and uh, we were talking about uh, farming and so on and Roy said, did you ever see the long hook that they use for loading bales? So Roy, I'm going to have you show, now we're going to try this in a wagon. Now we're just going to show you the hooks here, but uh, we're going to actually, I believe you uh, sit on the wagon and run the hook down and lift the bale up. So uh, this is something I've never heard of before till this spring. And uh, Roy, why don't I give you the mic and uh, maybe you can explain how many bales you did this way. And I know you had a bale loader also. Well, I guess our introduction to the bale, round bale, uh, father purchased a 1950 Alice Chalmers rotobaler and a roller bar rake. One big deal, all same day. Uh, we've been using it ever since, and uh, we stuck with round bales until we went to a haystacker in 73. How many bales? Two. Many. That's all there's to it. But we had up to 400 acres of hay. Up there we'd have two cuts of hay. Uh, we sometimes got a third if it was a real good year, but we were too lazy to walk down the roll and throw them on the rack. And I always thought that it was my brother Frank who invented it. No, he didn't. He was visiting a second cousin down in South Dakota where the bales were even further apart. And he came up with the idea. He took a regular commercial hook, welded a chunk of iron in there, and he said it weighed about 10 pounds. But he said it worked. He could stand on the edge of the rack, reach down with one hand, and hook him up. No problem. Well, Frank came home with the idea. I think this bale hook here is one of his originals. You could, if you look at it closely, you'll notice two things. It's got an open handle like this, so you put two fingers on both sides. You can pry that bale out of the hook, or you can pry the bale up out of the bale. The other thing is, it's got a fairly long, straight hook on it. That makes it easier to pull out and you just hook it in the bale. When you want it out you can either twist or hook it up. And of course on a, a hook this long, on a hook this long you didn't have much twist but if you just push it it would naturally come out. That was that was a bit of a refinement that we worked on later. But And the other thing is you made it out of 3 8 soft stock and it wouldn't take it. Especially the year that the bales froze in the field before you picked them up. and. Uh, they were picking them out of frozen dirt and they straightened it out. So you added a bit of a reinforcement. I think it's just a couple of electrodes tacked on there. And uh, later on we used uh, high tension steel. Potato chain worked great. And that's what these are made out of. Back to here. Thank you, Roy. Uh, this is uh, kind of a new thing. Uh, there isn't much new in the Rotovaler business because it's uh, been a long time since they made them. Uh, another interesting, Roy, will you show them that other handle there? Just uh, now, keep talking. This, this uh, gentleman, Randy Ringo, brought this in last year, and I'd never seen this either. 
and uh, kind of a different type of uh, bale hook, if you will. And uh, Roy said you had them in Canada. You seen them in Canada? There, there's a few used up there. Yeah. Yeah, I had never seen one before. So our, our normal hook was like this. This was our what we used on the farm, and uh, I had. I, I guess I know how to use those. But uh, anyway, that's just some little trivia that we've uh, put together. Uh, the rotor bale did not have a knotter on it, so it was never tied. And this was the answer to tie the bale. And you find the, the last twine, it's got a little notch in it, and you pull that, push that into the bale, and now it's secure so it won't unravel. So this is, we call them toad stabbers. But it is a twine inserter tool. So uh, another thing, uh, the ball hitch. When uh, we're, I'm getting a little ahead of myself, uh, that came out in 1947 with the round bale. So uh, we're going to talk a little bit about this also. Uh, another thing, as long as uh, we got a crowd here, this sign very important. Buy one of these, use one of these, be very, very careful. These are dangerous machines. And people got hurt, people got killed. So, uh, and this sign was not put on until later. But uh, just be very careful with them. Okay, we're going to start now talking about the baler itself. Uh, Alice did not invent the baler. Uma Lubin basically. Uh, yes. Sorry. Sorry, what did I do? Hello, Will. Oh. I can load up any. Uh, one thing I forgot to mention with those long hooks, it wasn't long before we weren't only using the hook bales up onto the wagon while you were stacking. That was much easier than carrying the bales on the stack. You just drag them everywhere. So the guys that were stacking were using long hooks too. Unloading the wagon, it saved you about one step for every bale you could reach further with it. And over the course of a day, that was a lot of steps. They were a, a pretty good labor saver, but they're still labor. Okay, thank you. Uh, Lewin family started working on this idea in Nebraska, 1800s, late 1800s. They had the idea, uh, and they come up with uh, different patents, different ideas of how to roll up the straw. And the, uh, the reason for the round bale was to get it in a package so that you could handle it. The straw was so bulky and they kind of needed to uh, take the air out of it and make it uh, so you could move it and store it. So uh, it basically uh, started out as a, a packaging machine for straw and then they would burn the straw for heat in the winter time but that's kind of how they started and uh, believe it or not uh, the Lubin or the Lubin family has an award and I haven't seen it in Minden Nebraska uh, I suppose it's at the Herald War Museum but it's uh, one of the uh, it's 31 number 31 most important invention of the uh, United States so number 31 so when you're looking at this this is this was kind of a interesting uh, groundbreaking technology and uh, the, the Lubin family took, uh, stuck with it right till they sold it to Allen. Now these two end bailers are uh, product of Umo Lubin himself. We believe this is the oldest one that uh, one of the first ones he built. We think maybe he built 75 of them. Uh, there's six of them known to exist. And uh, uh, Oscar Cook was uh, flying around. He was a block man for Alice and he was flying one of his uh, dealer meetings. He seen this guy uh, with these little bales behind it. And so he landed his airplane and started talking to Umo and figured out what is this guy doing? And they became uh, friends and later on uh, Oscar 
flew Umo to Alice and they uh, uh, sold the patent rights to Alice Chalmers. Let's move ahead just a little bit. Uh, Oh, uh, question was what year were the, okay, Omo got the patent in 1933. Uh, I believe there's a sticker on this one that says 37. Uh, but he didn't quite have a conveyor on it, but he had the idea of the bell chamber, the press roll, and a straight through design. Some of his, his, one of his early ones would come in and out the same way. And uh, I made a, a prototype of that. Uh, I don't have it here, but uh, it was not very successful. But it was the idea. He was working on the idea. Uh, this this baler now came from uh, Gilbert Bus in Canada. I had a chance to buy it 20 years ago, maybe. Eddie Card had it. Asked me if I wanted a baler, and I said, "Well, I already got one. I don't need two." Well, I didn't know it was the earliest roto baler. Alice that we know of. Okay, it's serial number 313 and uh, it's a working machine. We just got it uh, from Gilbert's Estate uh, last fall. We just got it uh, here a couple days ago. So we believe, uh, and Gilbert would say this, he think it's the oldest Alice round baler. Serial number 313. So go home, look at your serial number, call me if you got an early one. I don't want to buy it, but uh, you have bragging rights. <laughs> now, on the early ones, you, you notice that it doesn't have any shielding, any guarding on it. Uh, that was an upgrade. You could They came out. You could put it on. Uh, if you look at the early advertising, uh, it, this is how they, how they were presented. And... Uh, of course, in 47, you didn't have a WD, you didn't have live power, but uh, anyway, that's, that's uh, and it's got some unique features. It's got a little sprocket for the chain tightener. That was on the early ones. Got the cast iron handle here, maybe some cast pulleys. Uh, they didn't change much in the, the function didn't change, but uh, some of the manufacturing changed a little bit. The next baler is also a, an early one. I think it's 17, 1800. It's uh, our, so still a 47. This was the first year of manufacturing. Uh, very little difference here. Uh, it was just fun to get an earlier one, the earliest one that we can. So let's go to the next one. If Arlen is here, I don't know if I've seen him here a minute. There he is. Uh, this is Arlen Lemper. He, he's got a story he wants to tell on this machine. Well, put it this way, I think Gary wants to hear it. Uh, <laughs> you tell it better. <laughs> this should never have happened. First of all, they should have never put it together, but uh, we shouldn't <laughs> own it either. Uh, Gilbert Buss, we all talk about him. He was our Baylor guru. Uh, he'd been visiting down at our place uh, back in, uh, let's see, 1997. And uh, we was uh, restoring a Baylor. Uh, one that belonged to him, he'd bought down our way. And uh, then uh, he decided to go home. And on his trip home, I got a letter in the mail while he was on the road from Relation out in South Central Nebraska that there was going to be this self propelled Alice Chalmers rotobailer on a sale down in Kansas. So I got on the phone and got him located. Didn't have cell phones yet, or at least I don't think he did. But I got him located where he's going to stay that night and uh, told him about this. And I said, now you ought to have that thing. You're the Baylor guy, and you're the Baylor guy, not me. I don't want it, he said. You buy it. Well, wasn't very crazy about it, but uh, I guess the sale was coming up in two or three days. And so uh, Carolyn and I, we got a four-wheel drive pickup, went down there. We talked to the auctioneer. He said, whatever you do, come down here with at least a four-wheel drive pickup. The roads are horrible. This is in March. They'd had a lot of snow. Those guys don't know what gravel is. And the farmstead was just total mud. People were falling down and slipping and sliding. It was just a terrible mess. But anyway, we got down there. We finally bought the baler. We didn't take a trailer because we knew we wouldn't be able to load it. 
Well, then two weeks later, the conditions improved and we finally took the flatbed and away we went. We got way more money in this thing than we should have, that's for sure. But uh, we winched it on the trailer and then we had it run off the trailer with one wheel because it's so light, you know. And my wife was steering it and she has never forgot all this. And it's a bad deal. We shouldn't have this thing around at all. But uh, then we got it uh, fixed up. Gilbert helped me get it ready to go. We had to go through the engine and things. And for the 1998 gathering of the Orange in Marshalltown, Iowa, we had it ready to demonstrate. Gilbert demonstrated it and uh, he had a ball and we couldn't talk about it enough. But uh, then it sat at our place a while. Gary here was doing a special about roto bailers at the Orange Spectacular and he wanted this baler. Uh, it should have never left my farm without paint. But uh, it come up kind of quick, and Gary come and got it, and so that's why it's out here rather than at my place. It's a big joke. They made about four of them. This little company at uh, Phillipsburg, Kansas, called Nordine Manufacturing Company. Uh, we think we maybe know where three of them are now, and I'm probably guessing the other one got junked. But uh, my son will try and make a few bales with it today. He made some yesterday. Uh, he thinks it's a joke too, but uh, we're still. Still playing with it. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you. Uh, okay. okay. Well, it's a it's a unique piece, but today Vermeer has got a self-propelled round baler. So look at it as evolution of round bales. So uh, I seen it at Louisville this year. So that's kind of an interesting take, and this is where it started. So you got something Vermeer does it. <laughs> okay, let's keep moving here. We only got a half hour. We got a lot of stuff to go through. The next baler is, uh, we call it engine drive. It's got a couple of neat things on it. Uh, the engine, of course, uh, is a, was an accessory. And a lot of farm tractors back in the 50s did not have live power. But now if you put an engine on it, you could use your tractor normally we didn't have to disengage transmissions and so forth but it also has a twine guard the twine guard is a little gizmo that uh, invented in Iowa and it goes on top of the press roll it keeps the twine from wrapping around and it's a little yellow kind of cream colored thing there you can't see it but uh, uh, very very handy little gizmo to uh, prevent that twine in certain conditions uh, you prevented that. It also has another interesting thing on the, uh, it's called the soft center attachment. And that was invented by Elmer Olson and Bob Lee in North Branch, Minnesota. And Elmer was an Alice dealer. He also did a lot of custom bailing. And in that area, uh things didn't dry out as fast and if you bailed it too early you had what he called fence posts in the middle so he went to his local uh, blacksmith shop bob lee and had an idea and it varies the tension on the brake as the bale gets bigger as the rack comes up the gear comes up on the rack it puts more squeeze on the bale and uh, so you start out real loose and then you get tighter as it goes up. Uh, he got a patent for it and he got 50 cents a unit when Alice bought it. Uh, he got a check for 5,000 bucks. He split that with Bob Lee. So uh, Alice uh, redesigned it, made it a little more less complicated. Uh, I don't think it works quite as well but it's still a soft center. And this is a copy of Elmer's original. And uh, we're probably going to use it on the straw pile today. And uh, it works quite well. So soft center attachment. Still kind of a major thing even with the new bailers today. The next baler is what uh, Gilbert, when he was doing this seminar, said that he could take a baler out of a fence row, one day you could have it running. Well, guess what? This is it. And uh, Gilbert didn't do the work, but Lon Sager did the work on it. And uh, it was a, a, a very straight baler to start with, but uh, they freed everything up. We put some new belts on it, some probably some new springs, 
greased it up, lubricated it, checked everything, and uh, this is what we call the fence row brown baler. Uh, next baler is uh, continuous. It's uh, for every bale you gotta stop with the twine tie. Uh, this came out in 1958. Could have been a contender. Could have been a great thing. Uh, it does work. We have bailed with it. There's a lot more stuff going on to keep in adjustment. And uh, if we had time, uh, Gilbert and Roy were in a competition. And I think you had like 100 acres or so or 200 acres. And you started out with a... Did you have the standard one and Roy had the... Uh, or Gilbert? the standard. Okay, you had the standard and Gilbert had the number 10 and they took off and... And Roy won. That's, uh, we'll, that's where we're going to leave it. <laughs> okay. Uh, he got into some tall prairie grass or something, plucked it up, and it's, it's difficult to unplug. Uh, what happens here is the uh, is a standard baler. Uh, he goes starts normal, and then when it gets to a certain size, the uh, there's a little short conveyor that flips up, and the hay or straw comes over the top. Twine tube comes down, ties the bale, but there's also a fast strap. So it speeds up the speed of the tying, like doubles the, or cuts it in half. And uh, that's how they were able to uh, make it uh, continuous. And then you'd run double rolls through it at the start. Uh, usually to make them work, you had to take a single roll of hay or straw and you could go non-stop, but you could not run as much as a double roll as you'd normally with a standard baler. A standard baler likes a healthy appetite. You want that roll wide, you want it uh, so it kind of covers the whole conveyor, and that way you get nice straight bales. Okay, the next uh, item is the uh, same thing, only with an engine drive. Uh, that was an option, uh, probably the only one known to exist. Again, like Arvin said, totally worthless, but uh, it's unique, it's one of a kind thing. It's a D14 engine, and uh, uh, we have used it, and uh, someday maybe we'll try it again. Next failure is a uh, we call it a white top fast wrap. And this has got the carryover from the uh, number 10 to speed it up. So uh, you still had to stop, but it took less time to tie the bale. And uh, we don't see these around very much. Uh, we think maybe 500 of them are probably. Uh, built and then a lot of the number 10s were converted back to standard balers and they just left that fast wrap on it. It's got a little electric clutch in there for the two speed transmission. Otherwise, it's and if it doesn't work, it's just a standard baler. So, uh, if you're out and about, look for a fast wrap. They're kind of kind of rare. Um, was kind of at the uh, it was an option and uh. A lot of people would cheat and speed the governor up on the tractor, and it was almost the same. So there was there's ways to uh, speed it up, and that was a Gilbert thing again. We won't we won't get into that right now. Uh, this baler uh, is a later one now. Uh, it's a white top. It doesn't have fast strap, but you can see it. All of a sudden, you have guarding around it, and uh, this is probably hard to find. If you find a baler like this, the guarding is probably gone. People just threw it away. Uh, it was to keep your fingers and hands out of there. Uh, but uh, these, these balers uh, seem to bring a lot more money than the standard one for whatever reason. Uh, one of the changes that they did on it was uh, on the early balers, you had a planetary clutch system that was, uh, it worked very well, but it was a lot of pieces, a lot of parts, a lot of shock on that conveyor. 
Oh, this has just got a uh, belt tightener that uh, releases to stop the conveyor and then tightens it up when you want to uh, go to the next bale. Oh, this baler is very, very special. This has never, ever turned over. Never, uh, it's Larry Carr's collection. Uh, I'm hoping someday we can get it in the Smithsonian. It's new old stock, guys. Uh, you, it's hard to find anything like this. And this is here. And uh, never been hooked up, never been turned. There's still some wires in the uh, belt compartment from shipping. I, I, I don't believe they've been, I hope they never be taken out. But uh, anyway, take a good look at it. This is probably uh, uh, as uh, pristine as original as you will probably ever see. Now, at the end of production, they made about 77,000 of these little guys uh, in about 1970 or so. They quit and last three years they they waited a year and I think they made 500 balers uh, three years uh, every other year and then that was the end of it. And this is towards the very end. And then in about 1970, uh, they're doing some research in Iowa about big round bales, and Hawkbill came up with the idea, and this is this ugly contraption here. This is uh, a roll-up baler, kind of. It rolls the uh, wing roll ahead of a chain, and uh, then to release it, the end gate opens up, and you just drive away. There is no tying system on it. Uh, they sold a few of them. Certain places got along quite well with them. Uh, I call them mush rat houses. We have run it. Uh, Tom Graham, I bought it from Tom. He was up here uh, seven, eight years ago and run it for us. And uh, certain conditions, it's okay. And it's a cheap baler. It's, there's there's no, not a lot of moving parts. It's fairly easy to work on. You Coming up hydraulic at twelve. And uh, at twelve thirty today, we'll have the living history of the all crop harvester that will be presented by Arlen Lepper on the north side of the grandstand. So, if you're interested in finding more information about the all crop harvester, will be a seminar today at twelve thirty on the north side of the grandstand. Okay, I got one more. The Vermeer. Vermeer really pioneered the uh, the big round bale, and this is an early production. Uh, not the first one, but it's the uh, first series of this size. And uh, to give Vermeer credit for self propelled well, Sorry about the ending there. My camera ran out of space, so the last one kind of got cut off halfway through. But still a fun look at the history of the Roto Bailey. So that's all for this time. Hope you enjoyed, and we'll see you next time.